Our lesson today comes from the book of John. It comes from the John, the 14th chapter, where Jesus is meeting with his disciples for the Last Supper, the last occasion. This is it. Okay. On this last occasion, Jesus had some things to tell the disciples that they were quite unaware of, namely that he was going to leave them. We're going to start our reading actually in the 13th chapter with verse number 33, where Jesus says, Little children, yet a little while I'm with you, you shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, you can't come. So now I say unto you. Now, Jesus had actually said that a couple of times. He said that in John, the seventh chapter, verse 34. He said it again in John, the eighth chapter, 21. But he was speaking there not to his disciples, but to many people that really weren't receiving his words well. And he was explaining to them that he would be leaving. This would be temporary. He'd be going someplace they couldn't go. But now to his disciples, he repeats that. And this is the time of the Last Supper. Now, John, as you may recall, is the last of the four Gospels. And you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Some people dispute the order of their writing. I don't think that dispute is is, is, uh, justified. I think Matthew was first. He wrote in, in Hebrew, according to early Christians. There's internal evidence for that. Mark came later using Peter as his amanuensis or Mark, rather, was the amanuensis of Peter. He abbreviated and clarified some things that Mark had. Luke came later as a disciple of the Apostle Paul. And John wrote after all of the other apostles had gone. So the things that John has written intentionally do not include some of the things that he knows Matthew, Mark, and Luke have already written. Therefore, in the Last Supper, he does not even mention the passing of the bread or the cup. The other three have. Now, if John was the first writer, I've heard that before, there would be no possibility he would omit the bread and the cup, the most important features. But we're beyond that time. And John, in his old age, he already knows what he's going to quote, that Jesus has told Peter. John already knows how it already would turn out. So verse number 34, before Jesus leaves, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also should love one another. Now, that's a familiar text. You all know that. The more, the older I get, the more closely I try to read, and the more deep some of these meanings, words have meaning to me. We all know, I knew from a kid, that you should love the brethren. Nobody doesn't know that. That's how Christians would love, know one another, by their love. But this says, love one another as I have loved you. Oh, my goodness. This takes a little deeper meaning. As Jesus loved us, I don't think I'm qualified for that, <laughs> to love that deeply. But that's the, that's, that's the goal. That's the goal. It's a nice suggestion, isn't it? A nice suggestion to love our brethren. Oh, yeah, it's not a suggestion. It's a commandment. So this should absorb our earnest attention to make sure that whatever situations arise among brethren, we don't forget the primary commandment to love our brethren and be willing to suffer on their behalf if we're called for that. Verse 36, Simon Peter said, well, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus said, well, where I'm going, you can't come. You shall shall, uh, follow with me. You shall not follow with me now, but you shall follow me with me afterwards. And Peter said, well, you know, I'm prepared to die for you. Are you aware of that? So why can't I just go with you? I'm prepared to die for you. I will lay down my life for your sake, verse 37. Verse 38, Jesus answered him, is that right? Would you do that for me? Well, now he's going to, because you know how it all ends. Peter does die. And Peter not only dies, he's going to die by crucifixion. If the narrative be correct, which I think it is. And you remember when Peter went, was ready to be mounted on the cross, he had a request And they followed his request. They said, I'm not worthy to die like Jesus did. Turn me upside down. So Peter really meant what he said. I'm willing to die with you. But, you know, things that we're willing to do, we don't always do as readily as we'd like to when the circumstance comes up. Oh, boy, do I have experience with that. I'd like to do things, and I don't do them the way I know I wish to do them. So Jesus said in verse 38, 
Will you lay down your life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto you, you shall, the cock shall not crow until you have denied me thrice. You all know that narrative and how that turns out. When you go to the 14th chapter, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in me, in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That, that always seemed odd to me. In his house are many mansions. Well, that's not the way we use the English language. But what Jesus really meant was, in my house are many places of abode. He could have said, in my house are many rooms. And it's a very big house. Now, my sister Kathy had to sell a house recently. So I got into the real estate looking for a house for her. You know, it goes back a couple of years. But you think about a three-bedroom house, four-bedroom, oh, that's pretty, five-bedroom. Whoa, <laughs> how many houses, how many bedrooms are in the, the house of the master, of our, our heavenly father? Well, it's just, it's unthinkable. So in my father's house are many places of abode. But that's not adequate. He says, um, if I go, uh, let's see, I go to prepare a place for you. And verse 3, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and re receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And whether I, whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Now, Thomas said, well, no, I'm sorry, Jesus, we don't really know where you're going or how to get there. So Jesus said, that's right, I'll give you one clue. You can remember this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. That'll do it for now. That's all you need to know. It'll all become clear as time goes by. But this is a very familiar passage. But as many years as I was in the truth, I didn't really follow exactly what Jesus was saying to them. Brother Paul Legno helped me on this many years ago. He said, this is the language that a bridegroom would say to his beloved as he asked her to become his wife. Now, I never knew that. But what would happen in the Jewish custom is you would ask a young lady to be your bride. And if she accepted your next job was to go back to your father's home. doesn't matter how big it was. You would build on a new place just for your new bride and your new family to be. And then when you were finished, you would come back to receive her. Maybe she didn't know when you'd come back, but you'd come back, she should be attentive, and you would take her, go into the marriage, take her back to your father's home. Well, you all know how this is going to be fulfilled actually, because you know in Revelation, the bride of Christ is the church. And he's talking to his disciples, and he's asking them to be part of his bride. Now, in Matthew to the 25th chapter, the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, that's the predicate for that parable. A young man went into a far country to prepare a place, and he's going to come back at a time unknown. So we have to be ready. Now, that time has already come because he's already returned. But you get the point that the Lord's people should be ready and expecting that beautiful reunion. Now, when you go to the Song of Solomon, whoa, you really have this laid out in great detail. In the third chapter of Song of Solomon, there's a bride waiting for her husband to come. And she says, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to get out of my bed and go look for him. And she goes out and asks everybody, where is he? Do you have you seen him yet? And she comes across the keepers of the city, and they say, oh, we don't have a clue. That's the way it was, you know, as people were preparing for the Lord's return. It went out, and the keepers of the city really didn't have a clue. So she went beyond that, and there she found him. She says, I, she held on to him. She wouldn't let him go. <laughs> I can understand that. Now you go to the fifth chapter of Song of Solomon. You find the same scenario repeated. But this time, this bride is not quite as anxious, and she fails to get it promptly. Well, this is another story. It's another narrative. So in this passage, this is Jesus offering for them to be his bride. Now, I don't think they got it at the point that he said it, but that's what it is symbolically. Now, what preceded this, as you all know, was the passing of a cup. Now, this is something also I didn't know, that when a young man offered his hand in marriage to a young bride, in order for her to respond, he would pass a cup of wine in her direction. And if her answer was yes, she'd take a sip of that wine and pass it back. Had that happened here? Yeah, this is the Last Supper. They had all taken that wine, and they had all taken a sip. They didn't perhaps understand the meaning, but do you think Jesus understood? Of course. <laughs> he was offering for them 
to be his bride. Now we're going to show a number of pictures from the same thing that you sang that hymn from, because uh, this also I got from Paul Agno. He sent it to us not too long ago, a few weeks ago. I listened to the hymn. I was enamored with the words. They're the same words in our book, except one exception. I'll talk about that one section. You probably stumbled over it in the last verse. We'll talk about that a little bit later. It has a meaning. But it's more verses than is on our hymn number 93, in a little different tune. Now, I don't seem to be controlling it at this point. Is that right? Maybe it's over here. There we go. So that's it. Now, we're going to go through these verses, and we're going to comment on them, because these verses are really predicated on scriptural advice and scriptural thoughts. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Now, no, nobody here disagrees with that. We realize that the two olive trees are giving us from their golden pipes all the understanding that the Holy Spirit wishes to give us, and that's from the Old and the New Testament. But I think, in general, there's a lot of people that don't really grasp how firm a foundation the Scriptures are for us. Now, we can't go into great detail, but I'd like to mention three things with respect to the testimony of the, of the, of the Scriptures. Now, this is technical. We're not going to have much technical in our lesson today, but this is a little exception. This goes from Genesis chapter 5. You see the ages of all these patriarchs that lived before the flood. Now, if you look at those, you know that Methuselah reigned 969. He didn't really reign 960. We've dropped off the digits. I'll explain why for just a moment. But if you do that, you find that they lived a total of 6600s and 610s. Do you know that there's an ancient record historical record, not a biblical record, that matches the same record. It's called the Sumerian King List. And they have kings that reigned 28,800 years, 36,000 years. For... Nobody reigned that long. How is that? Where do they get those numbers from? Where do you think they got those numbers from? They got it from the record that they would have had from Noah. Everybody had records from Noah. Now, at the end of this, it's going to say the flood came and carried them all away in both records. Now, in the Sumerian king list, they don't include the first man, and they don't include the hero of the flood. Therefore, we have omitted Adam, and we've omitted Noah. But when you see the, and they, they give you very rounded numbers, so they only give you numbers to two significant uh, 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 quantities. Uh, they're called sars and nurs. You don't have to know all that, but that's, that's uh, Sumerian. But the point is, they have arranged this list of the kings, eight kings, between not including Adam and Noah, to sum exactly the parallel to what Genesis gives you. 6600, 6, tens. Well, they call it 66 sars and six nurs. They have a different way of counting. And if I had more time, we could explain how we know they forced the count to arrive at the sum. But we don't have that time, so I'm going to pass by. I just want to say, if people really dispute the testimony of Scripture, are they aware of the fact that the, latest, the oldest history in, that we have access to, non-biblical, actually is derived from the testimony of Genesis chapter 5? The other two things I would like to mention is that how many people know today that there is a prophecy in Daniel, the ninth chapter, that tells you 500 years ahead of time exactly the year that Jesus would die. How many people are aware of that fact? I'd like to say so much more about that prophecy, but I won't. But it's right there. And so we, we do inform people there is a prediction of Jesus, the year of his death, precisely. And in addition, we'd like to refer you to Daniel, the 11th chapter, much too detailed to talk about here today. But if you look at Daniel, the 11th chapter, the first half of that chapter, you'll find so much prophetic detail, so much, that hardly anyone really goes into it in detail. As a matter of fact, even in volume three, Brother Russell says, everybody agrees on the first half of this chapter. So we're going to skip it because it's too much detail. <laughs> well, if you look in Bible commentaries, you find everybody pretty much does agree. But it's so precise for six generations 
of, of rulers and their intimate experiences that Daniel predicts is going to happen among the earthly rulers that are governing God's people is remarkable. The only way you can explain the precision of that first, of that 11th chapter of Daniel is one way, if you're not a believer. And that is to just make up the idea that Daniel wrote this as a fraud hundreds of years after it happened. If you don't agree with that assumption, you cannot explain the precision of this chapter without grasping that this was divine providence and a fulfilled prophecy. Okay, we're going to go on to the next one. Oh no, excuse me. I'm going to go back a little bit and explain the meaning of what Jesus had told the disciples. The fact that they did not understand what was at hand. Did Peter or Thomas or any of the other 12 at the Last Supper say to themselves, oh, he means when he comes back, he's going to take us to heaven. Not a single one of them had a clue that that's what he meant. They didn't really know that until Jesus was raised. And then they realized this is not the man that he used to be. This is a person that comes into a room like that. And when it's time to leave, he doesn't even open the door. This is a person that looks different on different occasions. We don't even recognize him sometimes. This is a person that's spirit, not human. In other words, the disciples had no idea that there was going to be a heavenly calling. Now, I think that that's true. I think they did not know there was a heavenly calling until after Jesus was raised to spiritual glory. But you know what that does for us in the divine plan of the ages? That tells us that nobody before the time of Jesus, including all these people of faith, recognized that there was going to be a heavenly calling at some day in God's plan. Now, this is very helpful to explain to people that are kind of new to the truth. We always start with the chart when we start with something like that to recognize that there was no heavenly opportunity before this time. And therefore, if there wasn't, what's going to happen to all these good people that had faith before that time? Well, they will be raised in the thousand-year kingdom, but not with a heavenly hope. And if they're not going to have a heavenly hope, what are they going to do here on earth? They're going to help the whole rest of the world and mankind. I think generally, if Christians realize that there was no heavenly understanding of a heavenly hope, before the time of Jesus, which seems evident from John 14, I think they would be open to hear more understanding, let's put it that way, about the fact that there are not one, but two ages of redemption in God's plan, a heavenly and then an earthly calling subsequently. Okay, this takes us to verse 2. In every condition, in sickness or in health, in poverty's veil or abounding in wealth, at home or abroad on the land or the sea, as thy days may demand, so shall thy succor be. In other words, whatever experience you're in, that experience is going to be adequately provided for by the Heavenly Father and his care for each one of us. I still remember years ago, I was still in business at the time, I was at business, received phone calls now and then. But this time I got a phone call from Brother Carl Hagensick. I knew he was in difficulty. I knew he had a medical problem. And he said, Brother Dave, he told me a little bit about it. He says, I, I can't walk anymore. You know, Brother Carl couldn't walk for the last years of his life. You know how many years that went on? So I'm going to say, I'm going to say 17 years. And he was ready to experience whatever the Lord wanted to give him. Not only that, he saw it as an opportunity to express by his disability, his effort to continue his service to the Lord as much as possible. Did he really do that? <laughs> you knew Carl, you know the answer to that. He really did. I'm going to talk about somebody I don't usually talk about because it's too personal, but it's my father. Some of you know, it's been, what, 20 years since he's been gone. And some of you know he was very active in service and diligence. But you know that in his last years, he couldn't possibly be. He had a stroke so difficult, he couldn't even speak intelligibly. Somebody asked me today, what, did he have dementia, brother? Bill asked me, I said, no, never did. He was sharp as a tack, but he couldn't speak. He had a stroke. That lasted for the last years of his life. And uh, he was very active even during that time. I didn't know how active he was, but he was putting ads in newspapers worldwide for the truth. 
The last day, the day that he died, he went to the post office to make a shipment for people who were requesting literature from those ads. After his death, I went through his files and I found out not a hundred, not a thousand. I found 10,000 names of respondents who had responded to his worldwide advertising. 10,000. Now, what do you do? You just drop them? So we started a little publication. We sent it out to 10,000 people. And we said, if you don't respond to this one, you won't get another. <laughs> so, and then we followed up. We had some travels, visited Pakistan, visited other places. That's my father. Now, I don't talk about him very much because it's too personal. And I would, of course, be prone to magnify his accomplishments. But I actually believe in my heart of hearts that I was so unprone in that direction that I failed to give him the kind of attention and respect that I would better have shown him. Today, we have another sister and probably many others, Sister Jeannie Comer, who is facing some very difficult medical problems. Do you think that in these circumstances, as her days will demand, that God's sucker will be sufficient for the experience according to his best wisdom? You all know the answer. It absolutely will be. Fear not, I am with thee. Don't be dismayed. I am thy God, and I will give thee aid. I'll strengthen you, help you, cause you to stand, upheld by my righteous, omnipotent hand. Well, we know that whatever Jesus or God is going to do for us is going to be righteous. He'll never do anything other than that. And you know that there is nothing they can't do that they wish to do, that their wisdom and grace instructs them to do. Nothing. Now I remember Brother Comey. I said we might get back to Nigeria today. <laughs> Here's a little experience, personal experience. Uh, I think this was the trip that where Brother Comey picked me up at the airport with Brother Richard Evans. I think this was the experience. It wasn't my first trip, but a second trip. Brother Richard Evans stayed in the West. I went to the East. We each had an independent circle. We did the best we could. He did better than me. But I remember going eastward. Hope I got my directions right. I'm not sure. Uh, I was on a bus all by myself. I had some contact addresses in mind. I had a city I was going to stop on. The city came up. I stopped off the bus. Now what do I do? What do I do? How do I find this person? I've got a name and a city. That's all I've got. Okay. I wouldn't try that in America. <laughs> got off the bus. I said, oh, I'll find a young man that looks like he can speak English. I did. Found him. First guy. I said, do you know this person? Yeah, that's my father. Would you like me to take you to him? Now, I don't remember if it was really his father or his uncle or his, his something, but it was a friend. It, it was a family member. He took me right to him. Now, that's a little foolish, right, for me to do that? But you see, God said, yeah, I know, I know, I know, but I'm going to give you a little help here. Now, I went a little further. I think it was the same trip, and I was at the city of Uyo, and I was supposed to meet with some brethren and tell them that I, my schedule was different. I'd have to change my schedule. Okay, now I'm in the middle of Uyo. They have a town center. You stand in the middle. You can sit in the middle. It's grassy. It's got some stones there. you got roads from all different directions. Where do I go and what do I do? Well, I'm a little conspicuous when I'm in Nigeria. And so I'm standing in the middle in front of a public square. Somebody comes up to me and says, Brother David. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So they took me right where I needed to go. Now, you see, that was a little foolish of me, too. But God is there. He's there to give whatever aid you need. Now, I'm going to talk about something more important. And that is when Paul and, well, this was uh, Paul and, um, Paul and Silas on this case. It was their second missionary tour. They went through wherever they could find. They, they went through all the churches they had talked about earlier, he and uh, Paul and Barnabas. And they, they revisited them and encouraged their faith. And then they want to find some new opportunities. So he tried to go into, he says, Asia. That would be where Thyatira and other cities of the church were. That was new ground at the time. And they couldn't go there. The Holy Spirit would not let them. So they tried to go northward into Bithynia. And the Holy Spirit would not let them. Well, now, it doesn't sound like God has much help here. He's, he's not helping them. So they kept going, not north, not south, kept going until they couldn't go any farther. They're at the sea. And there that night, Paul has a dream. And in the dream, the angel says to him, Actually, it was a man from Macedonia in the dream. He says, come across the water and help us. So he took that as the Lord's will, and he went across the water. 
And then he went to Philippi. There's no synagogue. There was he doing there. But he went down to the river where the women sometimes gathered to have a Sabbath festival a celebration. And that's where he met, what was it, Lydia, the seller of purple. Guess where she used to live? Thyatira, the same place Paul couldn't go to earlier in Asia. And that's where she was moved and she helped him and she wanted to give him hospitality. And the church started in Philippi and there was no more precious church to Paul than Philippi. Wherever he went, they sent funds to him to ask to search, to try to support him and assist him. Did Jesus really use his power and ability to give aid to Paul when he declined to have him go north and south. Well, he sure did. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, and the excellency may be of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled in every side. We are perplexed, but God knows, and he takes care of us. And that will apply to each one of you who has a trial or a difficulty or an uncertainty. God knows and will give you help. The next verse. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not be overflow, for I will be with you, your troubles to bless and sanctify to thee, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. Notice our distresses will not merely be recovered, not merely be helped but they will be sanctified. In other words, whatever distresses we have, we won't simply endure, maybe learn a lesson, but they will be sanctifying influence on our heart and our mind. Now, I remembered something that happened years ago with Brother Comey in Nigeria. That'll never leave me. Those experiences never will. I hope they end up having the sanctifying influence that we all need in our characters. Notice that our distresses will be sanctified. Do you remember when Paul was stoned and left for dead because of his enemies? I don't think Paul ever forgot that. Why was he stoned? Do you remember that Paul ever witnessed the stoning of a fellow brother? You all know what I'm talking about. That's when Stephen was stoned. Do you think Paul felt bad about that? Do you think Paul felt bad about him being contributory to He didn't lift a stone, by the way but being holding the, hope, the coat of those that did. Yeah, Paul later made up a word. He made up a word in the Greek language when he says, I am the leastest of all the saints. I just noticed in a little, little a diaglot of some sort. It wasn't the Wilson diaglot. That word leastest is made up by Paul. There was no such word. He made it up to express how inferior he felt because he said he persecuted the people of God. So when Paul was stoned and left for dead, and then he woke up. He didn't have to wake up. He could have just died right there. It would have been the end. Next moment he knew he'd be in paradise. But no, God, God raised him. God uh, saw that he didn't die. Do you think Paul meditated on that? Do you think Paul realized, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know, I feel a little better now for what I did to Stephen because I think God has arranged for me to experience what I did and help me to recover a little bit for my sadness for what he did. I think that was a sanctifying thing on the Apostle Paul. What else do we have here? Peter crucified upside down. Oh, he remembered his experience. David, who had seen to the death of Uriah the Hittite. Oh, I cringe when I read that story. But David later left, lost his only son, Absalom. And he cried. Our collective experiences also will be sanctified for us. We got to go on. <clears throat> I will just add this point. Proverbs 16, 9. The mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Well, I'm good for that. I'm glad for that, that follow-up. Follow okay, verse number five. When through the fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flames won't hurt thee. I only design to consume, thy dross to consume, and thy gold to refine. Ephesians 6, 16, above all, brethren, taking the shield of faith, whereby you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. The wicked will throw fiery darts. Now, if you're not very prominent, 
they won't throw as many. But when you think of what Paul endured and what he experienced as God said, you are going to suffer many things for my sake. Well, all of us have some fiery darts at some point in our life. It sometimes hits our weak points. Now, that's where I have a problem. When you realize a weak point and then you realize a stumbling on that point, I guess that's how you realize your weak points. You count the stumblings. But you know what Paul said about that? No chastening for the present seems joyous. So sometimes we are chastened for our stumblings. Wherefore, lift up the hands that hang down and the feeble knees, and here's how you avoid the problem in the future. Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Wow, Daniel and the three Hebrews, they learned something about the fiery darts of the adversary. The three Hebrews, literally, the fire that it would have consumed them had not God prevented. And the, lion, the lion's den that later Daniel was thrown into. All of those were experiences that God used to shape them, but not to injure them. Verse number six. E'en down to old age, all my people shall prove my sovereign, eternal, unchangeable love. And then, when gray hair shall their temples adorn, like lambs shall they still in my bosom be born. Now, one sister comes up in particular, any number of people could in this kind of context. But one sister does in particular. Some of you might remember her. She's gone for a long time. She died at the age of 95. Her name was Sister Vivian Cole. She was easily offended. She was in our class from the time I was, could remember anything. I knew her. We got along well, but I had to be careful. I had to watch myself. And one time she became so offended, she left the class. She stayed away for a year. Then I missed her. She was actually a very pleasant sister, but she could get easily offended. I know that when I visited their house, they always had a box where they would put booklets out for anybody that came to the door. I went to the door and I saw the box missing. Okay, things are not working well. She's been gone for a year, the box is missing. And then one day she came back to meeting. And she came back with the most beautiful testimony I may have ever heard. She talked about her departure, about her regret, about her awareness of her own weaknesses, and just asked for forgiveness. I remember the elder that was governing at that time said, I don't think I've heard a more wonderful testimony. He didn't use the word testimony. Something else in my life. Well, I remember her very well. Like I say, we actually did get along very well. I liked her a lot. We went to visit her in our last days in the hospital. So when I was there, I spoke some kind words about our hopes and everything. She received it very kindly. Very nice. But I didn't have the right words. I didn't have the words I really wanted to give. Fortunately, my better thinking wife was with me. One of the scriptures that was very precious to Sister Cole was Malachi 3.17. They shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the days when I make up my jewels. So Ruth said to her, you're one of those jewels ready to be gathered. Oh, my goodness. Her face lit up with such a smile. <laughs> I'll never forget it. She liked my words. She loved Ruth's words. Just the right words. I think she's in glory. The last one. The soul that, is on, that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I cannot, desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, now that was up there, you saw it. Probably when you sang that word, you cringed a little bit. I cringed a little bit, but I decided to leave it there. In our hymn number 93, it's been changed. It's been changed to the word hosts. But really, hell is not so bad here. I'll tell you why. In, uh, in Peter, now let's see, where's my verse here? Second Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now that's not the word for hell usually used. That's Tartarus, and it's not even Tartarus exactly. It's a verb. 
He tartaru them. Now, that's not how you would say the word, actually, but that's the point. He cast them down into the place of, 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 difficult, of bondage, where they could no longer operate as they had before. But they can still operate. They're there, and they can still operate. You know what Jesus, for 40 days in the wilderness, he was tempted of the adversary, and he was tempted in a very difficult way, the kind of way. He wouldn't tempt me that way. He would tempt Jesus that way, because Jesus was more noble than I. I. We don't have time to go through the three temptations, but that's. But God didn't leave Jesus in that situation either. But there are demonic forces out there. There's a lot of them, and they would like you to stumble. Now, maybe you haven't had contact with them directly. I hope not. But they know you. They know you, and they're willing to watch your circumstances and to provide you with problems. Now, I have. I've had contact with them. Oh, not directly, you know, name basis, anything like that. But I, my, my mother told me about an episode that clearly was demonic in her early experience. Called on the phone. Somebody on the phone, she's calling for some purchase of some furniture when my parents were early married. And they said, the lady on the phone said something about her little finger, that my mother had an aberrant little finger. Now, how did she know that? She didn't ask her. She told her. She said, you're also pregnant. You're going to have a little child. Oh, really? I haven't mentioned that. I, okay. She knew how to hang up. We didn't buy it from them. <laughs> I remember an experience once I was with Sister Judy Hill, just the two of us. We were wandering out, having a nice time together. She's Sister Judy Mahoney now, those that remember her. And uh, she saw in the distance some people there that looked like they were talking, wanted to talk about something spiritual. The man was weird. He was just weird. Didn't have a shirt on. He was looking up. I just, I just wanted to avoid him. She said, no, no, let's go over and talk. So we did. I saw him lift up his head, think about it. He says, you're from the Don Bible students. Okay. That was time to walk away. <laughs> so we did. I could tell you more. I won't. But the point is, there are demons out there, and they know who you are. And they would like, maybe not to make themselves so obvious as those did, but they would like to upset you. So who is going to help us through this? Now, these are the last verses of this. I'll never, no, never. I'll never, no, never. I'll never, no, never, never forsake. Now, when I sung those words in hymn 93 as a young boy, I sang them loudly because I thought that was me talking. I will never forsake. I thought, yeah, I'm never going to forsake. No, that's not me. That's God talking, as I realized later. You see the early part? I will not. I cannot desert you to your foes. So if you have a stumbling, if you have a fault, if you have a little difficulty, and you fall into that area, Remember this text, this hymn that's unpredicated on Scripture. God cannot leave you. Now, if you want to walk away out of his hand and say goodbye, that's your business. But if you're in his hand, he is not going to forsake you. Those seven nevers, there's seven of them. That's God speaking. I won't forsake you. Maybe somebody else will. I never will. Now, this is like God taking an oath. I'm almost done. Thank you for your patience. Almost done. This is like God taking an oath. Did God ever take an oath anywhere? Yeah. You know, the first time he ever did, he swear to Abraham, because you've done this and not withheld your son. Your own. I swear to you that in blessing, I will bless all the families of the earth. Can we rely on that promise? He didn't just say it. He swore it. Like Paul says, that by two incontrovertible, th immutable things, his word and his oath, we can be sure of what he's going to do. You know, I checked just before I came here. I checked to see how many times God referred back to that oath that he gave to Abraham. 38 times. 38 times he referred back. Remember when I swear? Remember Isaac when I swear to your father? Remember Jacob when I swear? 38. I could hardly believe so many times. Do we remember? Of course, every one of us does. We know that Abrahamic oath. Let's never forget. And never forget that you, if you have faith, you're part of the seed of Abraham. Everyone that exercises faith, whether now or in the kingdom, will be part of that seed of Abraham. Whether you're going to be of the stars or of the dust, sand of the seashore. And God cannot forsake you. And he never will. God bless you.